Today we will talk about the issue of women in Confucius. There is a problem here in that the philosophy of Confucius and his followers run smack bang into a major feature of modernity, not only in the West, but also in Confucian societies, and that is the emancipation of women. It's true that in putting it this way, I am simply continuing the tradition of a binary analysis in which there are only two sides to the gender equation, male and female. And of course, there is also the question uh, of the role and the function of the intermediate people or the hermaphrodites, the gays, queers, and so on. Confucius is binary, but at the same time almost non-binary, in that the second partner in the binary equation is virtually missing from the Analects, namely the mention of women. There are very few instances of this. But needless to say, there is certainly no mention of the spectrum, those in between or outside. And there is no doubt an issue to be pursued here. But I will confine myself today to the issue of womanhood as understood in the Confucian tradition. Later on, repressive traditions associated with Confucianism include foot binding, concubinage and widow suicide. But these things come later and are not part of Confucius' teaching, though they came to be badged that way as Confucian. To begin with Confucius himself, in Analects 820, references made to the ministers of King Wu. He is said to have maintained law and order with ten ministers. But Confucius says that one of them was a woman, so that he really only had nine ministers. This seems to suggest that Confucius does not regard it as normal for a woman to be a minister, and so relegates that female minister to an invisible layer of society. And in 1725, Confucius says, it's only women and petty persons who are difficult to provide for. Drawing them close, they are immodest, and keeping them at a distance, they complain. Here also, Confucius seems to relegate women to a lower class and considers them to be pestilential and difficult. And this reminds one of Socrates' attitude to his wife in the death scene as described in Plato's Phaedo. His attitude was dismissive and seemed to indicate that the women were not worthy of the male company in his group. Lastly, in another tantalising glimpse into history, Confucius discusses the naming of the woman at the side of the local authority. This is in Analects 1614 and is a bit puzzling, but here it is. The official wife of the ruler of a state is addressed by the ruler as my lady. She calls herself little child. The people of the state refer to her as Lady of the Lord. In speaking of her with those of other states, the Lord calls her my little Lord, and they refer to her as Lady of the Lord. This one's quite complicated, but if it's intended to be generic, it sets out a protocol with nomenclature for the Lord and the Lady. And this name for the Lady seems to be deprecating in character, or at least she is required to refer to herself in a slightly self-deprecating way. I'm just the little child. Of course, the social reality may have been quite different from the naming. Having said all this, 
At the end of the day, the Confucian culture, as articulated by Confucius and Mencius, strongly endorsed the rigid separation of roles for men and women and placed everything in the hands of men, particularly in the hands of fathers and older brothers. Women were either wives or concubines, and they could not generally assume power and authority. These are doctrinal ideas which tend to dominate culture, but they do not tell us much about social reality, social history, and do not give us much insight into the lives of ordinary women who may have been businesswomen, widows of some wealth, women like the mother of Mencius, who was solely responsible for his education, and so on. Of course, it must be noted that there were duties towards women, and the reason for which they, women, are barely mentioned is probably that it was completely clear that they fell into the duty category. And of course, women were not entirely bereft for that reason. They were the beneficiaries of obligations. All the requirements of benevolence, then, were to be directed towards them, and they could so plead. It's not as if the men said, we are in charge here, you women are on your own, so sink or swim. They said, we are in charge here, and we have obligations to you women. But to be the beneficiary of a duty, whilst it is at least some protection, is very different from holding power and authority in one's own right, and perhaps to be the owner and duties, owner of duties, and the owner of obligations oneself. There's no remedy if the man does not fulfil his obligations or do his duty. And further, it is surprising to see no approach laid out as to how these obligations to women are to be fulfilled. There is plenty said about ritual and other protocols, but nothing about how to perform one's obligations to women. It does seem strange. The power to have an obligation, as opposed to being owed one, is crucial. Having said that, it was not my intention to denigrate the culture of duty. Since the Declaration of Human Rights and the French Revolution and then the Human Rights legislation which followed, we in the West think more about rights, and we demand them. We think less and less about duties and obligations. Our laws now emphasise rights more than they do duties. And in spelling out duties such as the duty of care in detailed legal terms, our laws replace and gradually destroy the role of culture. In Confucianism, there was a culture of duty, not a list of rules. On the level of the doctrinal, or let's say gender ideology, there came a time in the later Confucian tradition when the idea of the yin and yang, the opposing and differentiated forces, is applied to the difference between men and women. The yin and the yang are broad concepts about a dyadic opposition in things, where opposition such as light and dark should be expected as part of the way in which balance is achieved, through a kind of interaction and struggle leading to a balanced outcome. Harmony involves opposition as part of balance. But because maleness and femaleness was such an obvious opposition to raise in, in evoking the dyadic nature of the world, it eventually came to be a battleground. The characteristics of maleness and femaleness had to be spelt out to make the dyadic opposition of the yin and the yang work. 
And this is where the doctrinal issues, doctrinal issues become prominent because such leading ideas in a culture begin to dominate custom and practice and intervene in the administration of law. And so Dong Zhongshu, a later Han dynasty Confucian and a convinced dynastic exponent, involved manhood and womanhood with the definition of yin and yang. In the words of Professor Robin Wang, Dong was the first thinker to interpret human nature in terms of yin and yang. He identifies yang with human nature and ren and yin with emotion and greed. The earlier debate concerning the good, she continues, and bad aspects of yang is reconciled through the division of yang and yin. This constructive work turned out to be the rationalization for disparaging women's character and distinctive virtues and the consequent need for male domination in the gender relationship. So, Professor Robin Wang. From then on, debates over the nature of man and woman, the characteristics of manhood and womanhood, were conducted in the light of this dyadic opposition. Taoists had a different view, but still within the framework, wanting to assert that women had some yin characteristics, and so the debate around the role of women was built out of this theoretical framework of the yin and the yang. Perhaps opposites, or not quite opposites. Matching pairs. What is interesting is that this debate happened, showing that quite early on it was recognised that there was an important problem up for debate in the Confucian Taoist tradition, and that issue was the characterization of womanhood. I use the word doctrinal to make the point that this is not about social history. It is about leading theoretical ideas which tend to dominate culture. All this is not so very different from the Judeo-Christian tradition in which maleness and femaleness are built out of the respective roles of Adam and Eve. The first interpretation was that Eve was the weak one, the temptress, and Adam the man of reason and strength, who was seduced by his partner. But even in antiquity there were revisionist interpretations, with scholars pointing out that Eve had to confront the devil himself and deal with him, and that therefore she had the greater task, and Adam the lesser one of simply dealing with his partner. The doctrinal characterization of women in Judaism can be seen most clearly in Philo, the highly Hellenized uh, or Greekified Jewish scholar who writes as if the word woman throughout the Hebrew scriptures is a metaphor, a metaphor for sense perception and also sensuality as opposed to male reason. Womanhood is easily distracted by perfumes, sounds, colours and is accustomed to seduction. So Philo in the Jewish tradition. It's probably true to say that the relative characterization of manhood and womanhood was an issue of debate from the earliest days following Confucius himself. There have been female Confucius, Confucianist authors since then, and if one were to develop a feminist Confucianism, it would no doubt involve the essential features of Ren, benevolence, Li, ritual, and a very strong sense of duty and obligation. This kind of reinventing 
of course, does not appeal to fundamentalists who want to seek out the meaning of the original and stick to that and that only. But such evolution in interpretation does occur in the different traditions. In the history of early Christianity, there is very literal, lip, literal interpretation of the Bible. It's highly contextual and does get drawn into the contemporary climate of thought. So is reinvention of this kind evolution or abandonment? That is the question. How far would a feminist Confucianism go? In addition to the emphasis on benevolence, ritual, duties, qualities such as deference and respect, would we see an assumption that female freedoms and duties would include obligations to male concubines and the ability to have them along with one's own husband? Probably not. It could be argued that concubinage is an incident of the culture and not the main message of Confucius. These are problems for the reinterpretation of Confucianism for the modern world. So thank you for your company and my next and last talk will be on Confucianism in the modern world.